Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Seems as if we just adjourned. Welcome back, commissioners. Again, I'm Mark Levine, chair of the City Council's Committee on Health. I'm pleased that we're joined today by fellow Health Committee member, Council Member Inez Barron, and also our colleague, Ben Kalos, who will be speaking momentarily. Today, we're going to be hearing legislation relating to the inspection of water tanks and reporting on those inspections. And for those of you who are suffering from deja vu and wondering why a week after we did a hearing on cooling towers, today is actually an entirely different topic. This is a source of confusion I have found even for seasoned professionals in this business. And um, I'm happy that I think the Department of Health provided helpfully a graphic that um, vividly illustrates the difference between what is a mechanical system usually associated with internal air conditioning. That's a cooling tower. That can be a place where Legionella is found and therefore was central to our discussion last week of Legionnaire's disease. But today is not about that. Today is about water tanks. And you can see a fine example here. These are the beloved, iconic, round, generally oak fixtures on top of, of many, many buildings in New York City that provide our domestic water supply. And we're focusing today on issues related to their inspection and upkeep. Uh, as many of you know, the city's water mains provide enough pressure to deliver water to buildings up to six stories. Taller buildings need to use electric pumps to carry water into water tanks on top of these buildings and then rely on gravity to distribute water to the floors below. Um, we learned from DOHMH that there are approximately 10,000 buildings in the city that contain at least one water tank. And these tanks, I also need to emphasize, unlike cooling towers, have not been linked to any public health incidents in the city. I've interrogated the DOHMH leadership about this and Commissioner Daskalakis, and there, there has been no reported incident of a person getting sick directly attributed to the condition of a water tank. However, we're still here for important reasons. We want to ensure that every New Yorker has faith in the cleanliness of their water tower so that they don't refrain from drinking our healthy New York tap water, which is good for our bodies and good for the environment. And we do know that there have been failures in the upkeep and maintenance and cleaning of these water tanks some of which have been reported in fairly graphic terms. And we want to make sure that New Yorkers don't learn of that and stop drinking their tap water. That would be a loss for public health. It would be a loss for the environment. And so today is about ensuring that every single New Yorker has complete, unmitigated confidence in the quality of the water that's coming out of the tanks in their building. Uh, and to that end, we're going to be hearing, uh, excuse me, to that end, the New York City Council passed in 2007 uh, what was enacted to become Local Law 239, which requires building owners to submit water tank inspection reports to DOHMH annually and requires DOHMH to post documentation on these inspections on its website and on the city's open data portal. Local Law 239 came into effect in April of this year, 2018, and the uploading of reports to the city's open data portal is ongoing. The bills that we're hearing today would strengthen our existing water tank inspection regime. For instance, intro 1157, of which I am proud to be a sponsor, would enhance the training and certification requirements for water tank inspections. 
by strengthening our inspection regi regime and ensuring that building owners are held accountable for violating their legal obliga obligation to protect, properly inspect, clean, and maintain their water tanks, we can ensure all New Yorkers that their water is safe to drink. And from a health perspective, at the end of the day, that is the goal we are, all share. I do want to encourage everyone to keep drinking tap water. I'm also pleased that we'll be hearing a bill today uh, co-sponsored by our colleague, Councilmember Kalos. I'm sure he's going to tell us the intro number, which escapes me at the moment, but I'm happy to cue him for uh, remarks on this bill. Thank you to our uh, Health Committee uh, Chair, Mark Levine, for his leadership on uh, last week's issue of Legionnaires and this week's issue of Water Tanks. Uh, following reporting by uh, City and State by uh, Frank Runyon, I uh, frankly had the heebie-jeebies. Uh, I believe that would be the technical and medical term uh, for what was uncovered there. And one of the concerns was that people who had water tanks could clean them and then inspect them so we wouldn't as a city actually know what the conditions were prior to the cleaning. And ultimately as a person who represents a part of the city where every building I see from my window has a water tank and we've got a lot of tall buildings with water tanks, uh, I, I am sufficiently concerned that I want to make sure that we have an accurate picture of the conditions of our water tanks. Uh, beyond the report, the, the stellar reporting of city and state's uh, Frank Runyon. Introduction 1150 will correct this mistake, uh, which would simply require that the owner uh, first do the inspection prior to cleaning. Uh, after that, they're free to have a, another inspection if the DOHMH chooses to have such regulation. Uh, but uh, we want to know what the condition is like uh, year-round, not just at its best. I want to thank the chair and the committee members for this, uh, imp focusing on this important issue. I, I must apologize. Uh, there is a vote in the uh, Women's Committee as well as the Governmental Operations Committee in which I am on, as well as a hearing on a NYCHA infill project in my district. So uh, please excuse me, but we will be in touch with uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene following this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Welcome to fellow Health Committee member, Councilmember Keith Powers. And now uh, I'll cue the administration and ask uh, Committee Council to administer the affirmation. Zay Emanuel Halu, that's you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Please. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levine and members of the Health Committee. I'm Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, the Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm joined by my colleague, Corinne Schiff, Deputy Commissioner for Environmental Health. And on behalf of Acting Commissioner Oxidis Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on drinking water tanks and several related pieces of legislation. Drinking water tanks, as you heard, are the iconic round roof structures that dot our skyline and provide drinking water to many buildings over six stories tall throughout the city. <laughs> as you know, our drinking water is of the highest quality. It is tested over 600,000 times per year by the Department of Environmental Protection and is treated to ensure decontamination and safety. I can assure you today that our tap water is safe to drink. We know this because the health department has a comprehensive surveillance system that identifies clusters of outbreaks of disease and we have never linked a cluster of up or outbreak of disease to a water tank. The health department's disease surveillance system is among the nation's best and I would like to take a moment to further describe its impressive capacity. The surveillance system combines a review of mandated reportable disease results with syndromic surveillance, which is electronic information we obtain on patient symptoms and pharmacy medication sales that signal the possible presence of disease. We receive mandated reports on approximately 100 different diseases of public health concern, including enterohemorrhagic E. coli 0157 colon 87 the most dangerous form of E. coli, and daily reports of syndromic data from emergency departments, urgent care, emergency medical services, pharmacies, and school nurses. 
our expert disease detectives analyze data from these sources to identify signals that may indicate an increased cluster or outbreak. We have never linked a cluster or outbreak of E. coli or other pathogen that can potentially be found in water to a water tank. Based on our data and our epidemiologic expertise, we are confident that drinking water tanks do not pose a public health risk to New Yorkers. Although water tanks do not pose a public health risk, we agree that some regulation of them is appropriate. Indeed, both the Department of Health and buildings already do regulate them. The administrative building plumbing and health codes include requirements for their construction, cleaning, assessment, and reporting. The administrative code requires building owners to conduct an annual assessment of the tank and provide documentation of the results to both the health department and their residents upon request. Additionally, Local Law 239 of 2017 passed last year will further improve transparency about these tanks as it requires the health department to report information about the assessments to the council annually starting in spring 2019. Additionally, the health code requires building owners to report within 24 hours positive sampling of E. coli and coliform bacteria to the health department. The building code, which is enforced by the Department of Buildings, governs construction of rooftop structures, including water tanks, and the plumbing code details requirements for drinking water tank components, such as the design of the tank, covers to keep out unauthorized persons, dirt, and vermin, disinfection of the tank after it has been cleaned or painted, and a mandate for draining and cleaning the tank at least once per year. Since last year's council hearing on drinking water tanks, the health department has taken steps to strengthen water tank compliance. For example, we've instituted expansive ongoing physical canvassing efforts to identify previously unknown buildings with water tanks, and these buildings will receive summonses if they do not comply with the law and related health code provisions by January 15, 2019. Further, we are transitioning our current manual system to an electronic system that will go live in early 2019, which will automatically issue notices of violation to the owner of any building that has not submitted a water tank inspection report or attested that they do not have a drinking water tank. The new system will also generate automated violations for any component of the submitted report that does not comply with health code provisions. In addition, last year, we launched a tool on our website that New Yorkers can use to search by building to get information about the drinking water tank servicing that building. Notwithstanding the laws and regulations the city has in place and the fact that water tanks have never been linked to disease in New York City, we understand the council's desire to do everything it can to protect New Yorkers from situations that appear to pose a threat to public health. We have all seen, we have all seen um, stories and pictures of water tanks that are poorly ma maintained, and this is unacceptable. Any such conditions must be addressed expeditiously, and we, ded we dedicate to holding building owners accountable to ensure they meet the existing maintenance, health, and safety standards. We believe that water tanks should be properly maintained by building owners and look forward to discussing the package of bills being considered <coughs> today. But we are concerned that some of these bills would create mandates that are unnecessary given what the data tells us about the lack of a public health risk associated with these water tanks. Introduction 1157 proposes that people who paint, inspect, and perform maintenance work on water tanks hold both licensed master plumber status and a New York State certification. We support the bill's requirements for licensed master plumber status for those who do this work. Currently, the health department requires either a permit or proof of being a licensed master plumber to paint, clean, or coat water tanks. We would like to discuss further with the council the New York State certification reference as it does not apply to drinking water treatment or disinfection. We look forward to working with council to align these requirements in the administrative code. Introduction 1053 would require water tank inspection companies to submit annual reports directly to the health department. We believe that concurrent submission to the building owner and the health department would meet the goals of this bill. To help ensure the integrity of annual inspection reports, we also want to work with council to authorize the health department to require electronic submission of these reports. Introduction 1150 requires the inspection of water tanks prior to the annual cleaning. We would like to discuss this bill with council to better understand the intent. The health department's goal is to see that any issues identified during the assessment are addressed prior to the submission of the report to the department. Introduction 1056 would require periodic inspections by the health department, and introduction 1038 would require inspections when bacteria are found in the drinking water tank. 
under the existing regulatory structure when E. coli or coliform bacteria are found in the tank, owners are already required to immediately report the findings to the health department and they must disinfect the tank and take uh, confirmatory samples to verify the absence of bacteria. Existing laws and regulations designed to ensure the sanitary and structural integrity of these tanks are sufficient. And finally, introduction 1167 requires building owners to repair damaged water tanks within 90 days of receiving notification of the damage. And introduction 1169 requires visual documentation to be submitted with the inspection report. The existing requirement under the Administrative Code and the Department of Building Enforced Plumbing and Building Codes addresses the cleaning and maintenance of these structures, and the annual report includes examination of the tank's integrity and immediate correction of any unsanitary condition. From a public health perspective, <coughs> this is sufficient in order to maintain the necessary water quality standards. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and now we're happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Commissioner. One thing this hearing has in common with our hearing last week is there is a role for the Department of Buildings in overseeing uh, this regime. I'm assuming they're not here today. Anyone from DOB here? Okay, good. So we'll be turning to you for questions if necessary. Um, perhaps though, um, Commissioner, you can explain uh, where the roles between the Health Department and the Buildings Department uh, differ and uh, what, what, what actually is the role of the, of the Department of Buildings? I'm going to ask my colleague, Corinne Schiff, to okay. comment. Uh, as, as you've heard, there are um, mandates regarding uh, drinking water tanks uh, that live in the administrative code, in the health code, in the health department regulations, and also um, the plumbing code and codes that uh, the Department of Building monitors. I'll leave to my Department of Buildings colleagues to address what's in their codes. I can tell you that um, what the health code requires is that um, building owners conduct an annual um, inspection of the drinking water tank and do uh, water sampling annually and that that be reported to us. Okay, understood. Um, commissioners, how many violations uh, did DOH issue last year? Uh, so I think it would be helpful first to just provide a little bit of context about the enforcement scheme. Um, it used to be before 2015 that um, building owners were required to do these annual inspections that I just referenced a moment ago and the drinking water uh, sampling and then to maintain those inspection reports on site at the building. In 2015, we recommended to the Board of Health and they changed, took our recommendation and changed the health code to require that those reports be submitted to us every year. So we shifted from a system where the building owner would keep those on site to a system where they would be universally reported to us. Um, for the 2016 and 2017 um, reporting uh, years, we've issued uh, almost uh, about 580 um, violations, but starting, as you heard in our testimony, starting uh, with the 20, with this year's um, inspection reporting year, starting um, in early 2019, we'll be doing um, complete enforcement, universal enforcement. So any building owner that fails to submit that annual report will be receiving a violation from us. Okay, but can you talk numbers? So for the 2016 and 17 reporting years, right. we've issued uh, almost 580, about 580 violations. Are those adjudicated by oath? Yes, those are submitted to oath. How many were dismissed? Uh, you know, I don't have the exact dismissal numbers. I'll tell you that part of what we are doing in issuing those violations is continuing to refine our data to, because we're, we issue to, the, to building owners who have not submitted an annual inspection report. Some of those uh, owners we know go to oath to defend those uh, violations by uh, presenting proof that they do not have a drinking water tank. So we would expect some dismissals um, and we'll get you those numbers. We learned after last week's hearing uh, that the dismissal rate was, and we won't get into it today, but we learned that it was 88% in oath hearings for uh, cooling tower violations, are we facing potentially a comparable dismissal rate for water tanks? Um, so I can't comment on that um, right now, but I can tell you, we, we can get back to you about the dismissals, but I'll say again, part of what we are doing is doing enforcement, and this will be true um, in early 2019 too, when we do universal enforcement. Um, part of the strategy is to issue 
violations, giving the building owners an opportunity to defend that and say, I don't have a drinking water tank. And so we would, in this case, we would expect um, some dismissals. We are certainly, um, many of those are getting upheld. I don't have the exact numbers. I want to be precise. So we'll get back to and that. We're concerned about dismissals because on the one hand, if someone's being issued a violation when they did nothing wrong or they've been complying with the rules or they don't even have a water tank, then that's just, it's not fair to the building owner and it's a waste of city, the city resources. Uh, there may also be cases where the building owner actually did fail to follow the rules, but there's a technical defect in the violation that leads to it being thrown out. And that's also bad because if building owners aren't held accountable for the rules, then they don't have an incentive to, to comply. So uh, this is an issue that we definitely want to dig into. Have you noticed discrepancies in um, cleaning reports by vendor? Uh, I ask because w in, 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 our, in our analysis of the open data um, reports, we see that there are some vendors which may have thousands of cleaning inspections and, and almost no reports of sediment. And there may be others that have uh, very, very high relative to a smaller number of cases. Um, that could lead one to worry about uh, inconsistent work being done or either, either other motivations by inspectors. Have you noticed such patterns? So we'd be happy to take a look at what you've found. I, I would say a couple of things. I mean, I haven't seen it, so I don't know um, exactly what you're referring to. But I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, that's part of why we are supporting, I believe it's your bill, um, to require um, qualifications. We think that that will um, help improve um, uh, reporting and um, help um, promote confidence in our, in our drinking water, which is really, um, a, a, we, as you noted in your opening remarks, um, critically important. Um, we do have the finest, uh, high, some of the highest quality water in the world, so that's why we're supporting that bill. I'll also note that the inspection reports are submitted to us under penalty of perjury. The, the, as you've described it, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a problem. Um, it, it, so why don't we take a look at it, and we can and once we have details, we can um, provide a, a, a more detailed response. Right, we noticed that the two largest uh, uh, providers who filed thousands and thousands of inspection reports, I think, only had half a dozen reported cases of sediment. Now, one explanation could be that they're simply reporting on the status post-cleaning, and other vendors are not. Um, that itself would be, it would be, uh, I, th I think it would be problematic because it would give us an inconsistent read on the relevant state of different buildings. And uh, if New Yorkers really want to understand the state of their water tanks, um, to know the state before the cleaning is more relevant. And there could be a, a dead animal sitting in there for months and months and months. And then of course you clean it and the tank passes inspection, but we've never known uh, about a prior contamination. So I think it's important, I mean, the, the, your, your hypothesis about why the reports may look different is, is um, that, that may turn out to be true, so we'll take a look at that. But I think it's important also, we haven't had a chance really to talk about the, the inherent safety features that are built into the drinking water tank and why these are really an extremely low risk. You've heard from Dr. Daskalakis that there's really, we have found no link between disease and drinking water tank. And I want to just describe for you, because it's important as you consider the bills, um, the way that the water tank works. So first, the water comes into the drinking water tank directly from the source, as you know and, and said in your opening remarks, and, and I just noted, we have some of the highest quality water in the world, and so we're, the water tank pulls directly from that source. The water enters the tank at the top and is drawn from the middle, and meanwhile, any sediment um, or bacteria settle to the bottom. Uh, meanwhile, there is uh, residual chlorine that serves as an ongoing disinfectant for that water, and it's constantly being circulated. Every time we turn on the tap, we're drawing from that water, and fresh water comes in. And then finally, the the wooden structure itself serves as a natural insulator. So for all of those reasons, this is a very, very safe water delivery system, and we see the outcome in that, in the evidence we have, the lack of evidence of any link 
to disease. And so the system that is set up in the local laws and in the regulations is to require an annual check on that water tank. We want the building owner to go take a look at the structure, make sure that none of the planks have come loose, that the vents have not started to degrade. But these are very sturdy s structures that degrade very slowly over time. In New York City, we're requiring this inspection annually. Guidance from EPA is that they need to be inspected only every three to five years. So even if what you are hypothesizing is true, that's okay as a public health matter. The system is set up to be finely calibrated to the very, very low risk that we well, see. Well, with all due respect, I, I appreciate and I myself mentioned in my opening remarks the lack of any indication that people are getting sick from what's happening in water tanks. The, the public health interest is that people aren't grossed out and therefore stop drinking tap water because uh, if they if they move to other sources of fluids, whether that be soda or juice, that's bad for their health. Um, if they move to bottled water, that's bad for the environment. So really what, what the hearing's about and what the legislation is about is just going the extra mile so that New Yorkers, to put it uh, bluntly, just aren't grossed out by what is coming out of their faucet. Um, there were reports in recent months about NYCHA contractors changing reports, or maybe it was NYCHA's administration changing reports after provided by the contractors. Can you uh, update us on that uh, and explain the extent to which you have confidence that's been corrected? Um, I can't comment on, on NYCHA practices. I can tell you that we um, did um, following those reports, um, work with NYCHA to make sure that they understand um, the requirements. Um, they would have to comment on, on what that was about. Um, we inf the, the laws and regulations apply to all property owners in New York City, and we apply them, we enforce them um, in the same way. But that does raise the question of the extent to which you are uh, auditing the reports that are filed by vendors. Uh, or are you just take, taking it on faith? Um, so this is you know, an, another um, piece of the response is it, is it is one of the reasons that we are supportive of, of two of the bills. Yours um, to mandate that there be somebody with a particular qualifications who submits the report that will complement what is already required, which is that the inspection report be submitted under penalty of perjury, and also requiring that those reports be submitted directly to the department. Um, the bill, uh, I believe, uh, would require that before submitting to the building owner. We would suggest that it could be before or concurrent because we don't want any delays um, in um, repairs. Uh, but we think those would be improvements and would get at some of those issues that people are concerned about. Uh, but do you perform uh, inspections yourself, random inspections, <laughs> spot inspections of any water tanks? Um, so the, the requirements uh, set out in the administrative code and in the regulations are for the building owner um, to do those inspections. We've designed an enforcement system that is really calibrated to the extremely low risk here, and we do not, uh, we don't ourselves go out and do those inspections. If the building owner um, uh, identifies uh, coliform or E. coli, um, that has to be reported to us immediately, and we would have a, a close interaction with the building owner to mandate uh, remediation and then a, a confirmatory sampling to determine that that remediation was successful. And again, given the very, very, uh, the, the absence of a link to disease, um, the redundant safety features in these structures, um, we've calibrated the enforcement approach to the extremely low risk here. Um, you mentioned that there's a penalty of perjury for falsifying one of these documents or issuing a false statement. Has anyone ever been charged with perjury on these grounds? Uh, not that I know of. Not even in the NYCHA case? Uh, not that I know of. But that would seem to fit, that seem, would seem to trigger a perjury charge, no? Um, I, I would suggest that NYCHA respond to those questions about how about that about those reports and what and what had happened there okay well not, not, not clear to me why it wouldn't trigger a perjury charge considering uh, the laws if you as, as you just laid out um, I'm gonna cue uh, our colleague on the health committee council member powers us thank you just a clear is NYCHA here is anybody from NYCHA here today okay 
just asking. Um, the, you m talked about a point earlier where you might issue a violation to a building, then they will show that they don't actually have a water tank, and then the violation will be dismissed. Can you explain to me what is the process by which or why maybe perhaps somebody's getting a violation if they don't have a water tank to begin with and then have to defend the, the not having one? Sure. Um, so the, the um, enforcement system before 2015 was that building owners had to conduct these annual inspections and they had to keep those reports on site at the building. And the department would do an audit of a, of a certain number of those every year visiting the building to look at records. In 2015, we changed to a much more robust enforcement system requiring that all of those reports actually be submitted to the department every year. That started with the 20, uh, started in 2015. Um, the challenge that we faced is to come up with an accurate list of all of the building water tanks um, in, in the city. We took a very conservative approach to that and probably overcaptured buildings. And so we have been working um, since 2015 to refine that data. We've used a number of strategies. Um, we've done a, a lot of outreach to building owners and to the tank companies to alert them to the new universal um, submission requirement and that and gave them an opportunity to say, that's not me, I don't have a drinking water tank, please pull me off of your system. Um, this past summer we did a data match from the buildings that we had in our drinking water tank um, online submission system with the data that we have about cooling towers so that when our inspectors were doing cooling tower inspections at a building that we thought might have a water tank, they could check. Um, and, in, and some of the strategy we have used is to, sum, is to issue violations for failing to submit a drinking water tank inspection report. And that is another moment for the building owner to say, I don't have a drinking water tank. We've been using these strategies to refine our data to come up with a more accurate list we think the, the big leap that we're making with the 2018 reporting year to submit to issue violations to all building owners who fail to comply with the import reporting requirement will help us further refine that, um, that data and we'll be able to get to a more accurate list and then our violations will be um, only to those buildings that actually have drinking water tanks. So just to clarify, it sounds like you tried to create kind of an accurate picture at the time of the universal submission using, I don't we maybe can explain the methodology about how you decided to sure. that list, and then have been subsequently narrowing it down. <clears throat> Some got, who you, who you made an assumption had a cooling tower, uh, sorry, a drinking tower, water tower, had a, um, received one, and then subsequently said, I don't have it. Can you tell us just how you determined that list of originally? Yes, uh, and that's, that's uh, your, your paraphrasing was, was, was correct. So um, the drinking water tank um, uh, w would sit on, any, on a building that is seven stories or above um, because of the, uh, a building smaller than that doesn't, doesn't need one. So we took a very, very conservative approach to develop our list. There was no list, um, so we had to create one. And so we uh, pulled the buildings that were seven stories and above and then have been working our way down to make a more accurate list. And we've, so we've we took this conservative approach so that we didn't miss buildings. And um, over time, since this change in 2015, we've, we've been um, pulling those numbers down. So your list today is how, how, how accurate do you believe your list is today? I think we're getting there. Um, but we really think that this change that we are making, we're in, we're in development with our technology. Um, we'll be doing this in, in early in the new year for the 2018 um, reports. We think that's going to get us a long way there. And how many, how many, I don't know if we asked this, but how many do we have in, on, on your, how many are on your list buildings today? Um, so I, th you know, we're continuing to, to drop this number as we get better and better data. We don't, we don't have, we don't have a great number. Now we know that, it, um, that there have been reports uh, submitted by 5,500 buildings. So we know that it's at least 5,500. Um, but I think once we're, once we are through the enforcement of 2018 reports, we're going to know a lot more. I can't promise that in just one year we'll, we'll, we'll get to the absolutely accurate picture, but I think, I think we're going to make a, a, a big leap in our, in our data accuracy. Does 5,500 represent the amount of buildings that are under seven stories, or is it uh, other buildings that are under seven stories that don't have a water tank? If that makes sense. Like what does the 5,500 number represent? So 5,500 is the number of buildings that have submitted drinking water oh, okay. tank inspection reports to us. 
and then presumably there's some that haven't that are yeah. expect that there are some that haven't and we'll learn a lot more about that when we issue you know right now we're issuing um, it's a very it's a labor intensive manual process so we're not able to get to everyone so starting with this year's reports we'll be issuing a violation to everyone who is in our system either as not having submitted a report or not having told us that they don't have a drinking water tank got it thanks and just one last question um, and thank you to the chair for, for giving me an opportunity to ask questions uh, 1167 requires building owners to repair damaged water tanks the 90 days of receiving notification not that I've heard any complaints about it, but I'm just, I'm just, so just a basic question is, does 90 days seem like a time period that will be reasonable for building owners to comply with? Um, so we'd actually um, appreciate the opportunity to, to, to speak with council about that. The, our um, regulations require that um, a, uh, that, the, that um, problems with the structural integrity of the tank be repaired immediately so um, we we want to make sure that this bill um, wouldn't set up a regime that's that's less protective than what's in place now so we want to talk with you to make sure we understand what you're trying to get at and see if we can um, make sure that we don't lose the protections that we have in place now so you're the other way so so uh, what is immediately under your definition so when they submit the report to us the entire the, the entire system is designed to drive um, good public health practice right. So the point is that the report that they submit to us is, um, uh, asks them to demonstrate, to, to attest that there has been a correction. So what immediately means probably depends on what needs to be fixed. Um, but in other words, we're not saying uh, at your leisure, whenever you get to it, the point is there's something that needs to be repaired, repair it, tell us you've repaired it. So 90 days under your, so 90 days could actually be too long if there's like a public health risk due to the, the I, I don't want to give the impression that there's a public health risk. These structures um, degrade slowly. They're very st sturdy. So the point of the system is that every year, which as I noted is much more robust than what, what EPA guidance is, which is every three to five years. But we say to building owners every year, we want you to take a look at that tank. Make sure that um, the vents continue to be covered, that the rungs of the ladder have not become loose, that there isn't a plank that's um, starting to be dislodged. I think it's sort of, I think of it as kind of a, st a stitch in time, uh, saves nine. So we want building owners to do that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's any immediate risk, but we want them to maintain um, those, the, the tanks um, over. I just wanted to comment briefly on risk again. Um, so I think that um, that the current uh, scenario of, of, of response time, um, the answer from the public health perspective is that there's no signal for a disease risk. So what's happening now in terms of response to these um, water tanks is um, happening fast enough where there's nothing that's signaling to us that there's any um, human disease. And I, again, <clears throat> Our surveillance system is extraordinarily robust, so we'll hear about certain bacteria or parasites that we would associate with water, but we also hear about syndromes that happen in, in neighborhoods, and we even go down to the resolution, which is something that you may not know. Uh, we get reports from pharmacies about um, sales of anti-diarrheal medicines. So if we start to see that there's something in an area, you know, more sales of anti-diarrheal medicines, we then start to do really boots on the ground public health work go out and see if there are any new cases of disease that are landing in doctor's offices or emergency rooms or urgent cares in the area, and then we pursue them. And so despite this combination of technology and boots on the ground, the risk is, is inapparent from the perspective of, of patterns of infections that would be associated with water exposure. Thank you. appreciate that. Just following up on that last point, uh, I'm a little familiar with the point about the tracking. So, and who, who are you receiving data from today in terms of um, uh, it's over the counter, I think, right? It's not prescriptions. Right. So, so which, which uh, pharmacies are you receiving data from? So um, we, we are increasing the number of pharmacies that we are getting the data from. Um, right now, it's a lot of sort of smaller private pharmacies that we're getting, and, we're, and some other chain pharmacies are slowly coming on board. So it's a sample of pharmacies, but there is a, enough of them where we can sort of get a general sense of what's happening. The other piece that's really important is that um, places where people come in with diarrheal syndromes, like emergency rooms and, and some urgent cares, um, we, we do get... 
uh, syndromic surveillance data hourly from some emergency rooms, others we get daily, and then we also uh, are increasingly getting information from urgent cares, again, because we're responding to the way New Yorkers pursue health care, and a lot of them are going to urgent care over emergency departments um, routinely. So I think, you know, the combination of this sort of syndromic, um, like, rough sketch of what's happening with disease using pharmacy data as well as, as clinical venue data. When you then meld that with our disease detectives that actually go out and sort of pursue more information along with our automated surveillance that we get um, for specific bacteria or protozoa, um, come together to really create a picture that lets us hone in. And even again, in honing in, a water tank has never been attributed as a source of a, of a pattern of a cluster of disease. And sorry, one last question. Yeah. Sorry, probably. I so, love to talk I, about I was this curious about this. You you receive this data, you see there's a, a surge in something, and then and then what happens? Yeah, so it's it's a really interesting combination of technology and, and human power. So what'll happen is we'll get the syndromic data um, that comes in in an automated fashion. Um, we are looking at that. And they're auto-reporting to you. Yeah, so it comes automatically. Um, and so we, we get this information electronically, and our team of disease detectives that are responsible for both syndromes as well as a hundred of other reportable diseases will actually look into the patterns of what's going on with syndromic data. And then they'll look at other data sources to see if we're getting increasing reports of certain bacteria. So if we're getting more of this um, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, or we're seeing more cases of, um, of, of cryptosporidiosis, um, what, uh, what happens is that we then overlap these data and actually go out boots on the ground uh, investigating in the areas where we see these little sort of flares or spikes to see if there's something actually going on. So, um, and so we, uh, so we actually can give you more detail also about the pharmacies that are involved, but we are increasing the number of pharmacies that we're getting. And so all that comes together to actually generate a picture that combines technology and sort of human power to go out and actually get a sense of what's going on. Is it cum cumbersome on the small pharmacies to have to provide you ongoing data about, uh, I mean, it's like an automatic system. It would feel like difficult for them to set up and report. Well, excuse me, one more time. The small pharmacies, right? It would seem just me just cumbersome to like the neighborhood pharmacy to have to report data in some automated fashion to the Department of Health every month or every week or yeah, I mean, but the good news is that um, though it may be complex at the beginning, we're getting more and more pharmacies on board, and it becomes less and less complicated as it as people uh, people are sort of uh, brought into the system. So it's it, ma it's mandated or voluntary that they report. It's it's part of our health code. Better. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Powers. Um, I, I actually have to correct the record. So it's, uh, it, is, it is voluntary. But we're having increasing numbers of pharmacies um, that are signing on to do this. <laughs> so that's why some of the chain pharmacies haven't done it yet. So I, 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 can I, I just ask a follow-up question? I was, I was under the belief that chain pharmacies do do it, and it's mandatory. So it's, 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 um, as, it's voluntary. Thank you. Okay, just to understand intro, your objection on intro 1167, as Councilmember Powers was questioning, is that establishing a 90-day requirement might actually lead people to wait longer to make the repairs. Could we not fix that by then just reducing that to 60 days or 30 days or whatever you think is the appropriate? So we'd like to talk with you to make sure that this is, um, that we're not undermining the, a more protective regime. So I think we should talk about it, figure out wh where you see a gap. Our requirement is that you, if they identify a problem, they fix it without setting out the timeline. Um, and, and that but, that But there, there, there are buildings which are waiting a lot longer than 90 days, right? That it's, the, it's those outliers that we're trying to crack down so on. I think, I, one, I think we should have a follow-up conversation. I, I, it's not that we disagree that the repairs should be made in a timely way. I think we, we just need to find the right, the right cadence there. And, and I want to point out that the bill does have a provision for uh, the building owner requesting an extension for extenuating circumstances. So there is some flexibility there, but we just want to make sure that people don't abuse uh, the lack of a firm date under the current system. Um, so, uh, we, we, Guillermo from DOB, I realize this is like your second day on the job. Are you prepared to come and answer questions? Wonderful, come on up. And I'll ask uh, Zay to please give you the affirmation. Okay.
I'm told you're a little bit more of a veteran than this being your second day on the job, but I think this might be your first hearing. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a year, though. So. It's been a year. <laughs> okay. Um, happy to have you here. Uh, Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. So, so uh, in, 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 in Commis Commissioner Daskalakis's opening statement, he described the plumbing code, which is a component of our building codes that detail um, requirements for tank components, such as the design and uh, covers to keep out uh, people and dirt and vermin, et cetera. Um, it's, I, I guess everything that's in the category of, of sort of the physical structure of the tank seems to fall under DOB uh, via the plumbing code. Is that accurate? That's correct. Between the building code, which speaks to certain structural issues like uh, the support of tanks, uh, their location on, on a roof, and uh, the plumbing code, which speaks to design elements of tanks and uh, the, the requirement that they be drained and cleaned annually, uh, t together they speak to the structural issues related okay. to tanks. So does DOB then enforce this this uh, component of the building code? So the construction issues are enforced, uh, the construction elements rather, are enforced uh, during plan exams. So when uh, owners submit plans to the department, uh, we make sure that they're complying with all the requirements in the building and plumbing code. And that's uh, the, the mechanism by which we enforce the construction requirements. Right, but we're, we're most, I would certainly be alarmed to learn that tanks are defective out of, out of the gate, but it, we're really more concerned about tanks degrading over time. So does DOB step in if uh, defects emerge over time because of wear and tear? So to, to the extent where we're made aware of conditions, we would uh, issue violations uh, for these conditions. And so how many violations have you issued uh, in, the, in the last year? So in 2017, we did not issue any violations. Not one? No, not, what not about 2016? structural issues. What about 2016? Uh, we, we only look back to, to 2017, but I can get back to the committee with that information. So essentially, there's no violations being issued for the structural defects from DOB. No, we have not issued th those But we know that there are tanks with structural defects. No, I don't think anyone denies that. <coughs> even if it's a small percentage, even if it's one or two percent, but, right? So how are, how are they getting away without being sanctioned? I mean, if we're not made aware of the condition, so, so the uh, complaint, for example, uh, it, it would not get onto our radar and we would not perform uh, an inspection or issue any violations related to those but conditions. So how, how hypothetically, how in theory would you become aware? That complaint, if we receive a complaint, we would, we would become aware, but um, also in, in the annual uh, check that owners have to, to, to perform every year, a cost to be performed, usually by licensed master plumbers, um, structural issues are something that they need to check for. Right, so in the thousands of reports filed by the master plumbers, they've never reported a single structural defect? For the, to my colleagues that helped who received the reports. So that, um, that check on the general integrity um, of the tank, which is part of our um, annual inspection report, um, the building owner would indicate whether those have, been, um, those have been corrected. So there is, a, there is a, a, an, an element of the enforcement that the health department does in terms of the inspection reports addressing the so, structure so of the So there's like, there's over, it seems like there's overlapping jurisdiction here and so that it would be the health department who may be issuing the fines? Uh, right, and, and um, speaking, responding generally to your question about the integrity of the tank. But, but so someone's got a hole in the roof, right? We know there are tanks with holes in the roof. So is anyone getting fined for holes in the roof of tanks and similar problems? So uh, under the um, health department's requirements, um, a hole in the roof would be a, um, a structural issue um, and perhaps a sanitary issue that would need to be um, indicated on the inspection report or remediated and then indicated on the inspection report that it had been remediated. So that would be part of the health department's um, inspection requirements. And, and are any such defects reported in any of the reports? Um, we would have to take a look at the, at, at the data to find, to, to get back with the details about that. But so, so the 580 uh, fines that you uh, referenced earlier, none of them relate to physical defects? 
I would have to check. I believe that those violations were for failure to submit the report. Right. We'll have to check. So it's, it's inconceivable that of the thousands of tanks in the city, none of them would be found to have physical defects just because we know of anecdotal reports and with that many tanks that are that old and this climate, it's almost, it strains belief that there would be no defects. So what it sounds, it sounds to me like we have a failure to enforce for the physical integrity of the tanks. And a system like this that requires reporting from the public which is generally not going to go up to the roof of their buildings and look at the tanks, is inadequate. Uh, so it's, fall, it's, it's therefore going to fall, out, fall on under, I guess, fall on the, on, onto the building owners and the reports that they're submitting. But there you have a conflict in which the people who would potentially be fined are the ones who are being asked to report these defective conditions. Am, am, am I correct in everything I'm saying? So I, I think there's a couple of things that are important um, to note um, with respect to the to the physical integrity. First, the reports are submitted um, to us under penalty of perjury. They require they they are the system is designed to drive compliance by requiring that that those defects be corrected. Um, and then finally, we think that those. Uh, the bills, uh, your bill and the speaker's bill, which would require submission to the department um, either before or we're suggesting adding concurrently to us and that they be submitted by um, someone with particular qualifications will be improvement to the system. But I do want to go back to what we think is really fundamental here, um, which is that we have never linked um, disease to a drinking water tank, that the tanks themselves are have multiple safety features redundant systems that keep our water very, very safe. And so we think we really have an enforcement system that is properly tailored to the extremely low risk here. But, but just, so, just so I get my facts right here, so we have a system that relies on self-reporting under penalty of perjury if the documents are falsified. But we know of no perjury charges being filed and there were zero violations issued at least in the last year uh, so either we have uh, a pristine stock of water tanks and everyone told the truth in their inspections and no violations were warranted or there are defects which are not being reported or being inaccurately reported and we don't have a system to catch that so I will add that in our, with the 2018 inspection reports, in addition to having a universal enforcement so that any owner who fails to submit the report um, will be issued an, a violation, um, we, are, we are also building into that system um, uh, catching uh, failures to correct and issuing violations for violations of the health code. So we're, we are um, also closing this enforcement gap with the technology improvements that we're making this year. Okay. Are there ever 311 calls related to water tank defects? Uh, so New Yorkers can call 311 when they have concerns about their water. Um, depending on the nature of that complaint, it goes either to DEP or to the health department, and we work closely with each other to make sure that if calls are, um, re are misrouted, that they go to the right agency. Um, I can tell you that in 2017, um, we received 154 311 complaints, and um, two of those uh, mentioned a drinking water tank. We follow up um, on all of those. But, but those might have been for discoloration in the tap water or unusual taste in the tap water, right? Is that, is that what you're counting in that number? The ones that come to the health department are ones that make a reference to a health concern. Right. Um, but you say there's two, there were only two 311 calls in all of of, I think you said, I'm not sure if you said 2017 or 2018, but only two in the last year that cited the condition of a water tank explicitly. Correct. So that reinforces uh, my previous point that the public just doesn't go up on roofs to look at water tanks. And so a system that relies on them to be the eyes and ears isn't going to catch the vast majority of problems in these tanks. 
it seems to me that the, the only solution is to have some sort of auditing scheme or spot inspections, something other than pure trust of self-reporting. I'll also point out that there's a small number of companies which do these, the vendors which do this work. Many of them have been with their buildings for many, many, many years. And one could worry, as we saw in the NYCHA case, that there's a level of confidence, uh, an excessive level of, of confidence developed between the, the vendor and the building owner that allows for things to start to slip or corners to start to be cut. And it's just it's one more rationale for some vehicle for auditing or double checking or otherwise um, verifying the veracity of these reports. Fair statement? So we think that the improvements that we're making with the 2018 um, inspection year will, will go a long way. We'll be issuing violations to all building owners who fail to submit the reports. We'll be issuing violations where those reports show health code um, uh, failure to comply. But we really think that given the very, very low risk um, related to the, the absence of a link to disease, to the very, very safe um, century-old system for water delivery that these water tanks um, uh, have, and the federal guidance, which is inspection every three to five years, um, we really think that as a public health matter, the council, the administrative code, and the various regulations um, have this properly calibrated. And just to clarify, if someone does to say, hey, my water, the water coming out of my faucet is either tastes, smells, or looks funny, uh, does someone go out and look at the tank? Um, so taste, smells, looks funny. The, the 311 calls that will be routed to us will, uh, are those where there's a health concern so I think in the way that you've described that complaint, that would be a DEP complaint. I'll tell you that when we get complaints, we, um, we follow up on all of those. Uh, a complaint like this would probably um, be addressed by somebody running their water for a little while. That, that sort of thing can happen when there's disruption in the pipes, it loosens some sediment. Um, we follow up with the complainant, if it's, if it's a complaint that comes to the health department. Um, should, there, should we, in that consultation, feel that there's a need for us to go to that apartment and do an inspection, we would do that. Um, we don't always need to do that. We frequently can resolve that um, with conversation with the complainant. Do you know out of the 150 or so 301 calls last year, how many uh, prompted you to inspect a tank? Uh, I don't have that number. And, and I want to just be clear not to, uh, that, that our inspection may not be an inspection of the tank. We may be going to that apartment to, to, um, to see what the issue is. But it's very, very unusual. I, I would be surprised if we, if we, we'll get the numbers for you. I don't have that with me. Um, but most of the time, these can be resolved um, in conversation with the with the complainant. Okay. In uh, your in, in Commissioner Daskalakis's comments on Intro 1157, you pointed out that um, a concern with New York State certification referenced in the bill. This is uh, the bill describing. Uh, who works, who, who can do this work on these tanks. And I, I just want to understand, is, is that related to the DEP rules about applying insecticide? And, and are, are you saying that therefore it's too lenient because it offers another way in? I, I didn't understand your objection on that bill. So there, were there are two things that we want to work with you on to make sure that um, we're, we're not incorporating inapplicable requirements. The state certification just doesn't apply to this context. And the, the, um, the health department right now has, we already permit um, those who will uh, paint and clean the water tank. And our, those requirements are a little bit different. They're to be either a master plumber or to have our permit. So we just want to make sure that we're aligning everything correctly, incorporating all the right right requirements. We are, we're supportive of the bill, so I think it's just a little, um, I, I think it'll be easy for us to resolve. Okay. Um, thank you very much, commissioners, for your testimony today, um, and uh, we look forward to continuing uh, working with you on this critical issue. And I'd like to call up uh, our next panel, which includes Eric Goldstein of the National Resources Defense Council. Jackie Gallant, also of the NRDC,
Terrence, a.k.a. Terry O'Brien of the Plumbing Foundation. Uh, Deputy Borough President of the Bronx, uh, Marika Scott. Just want to um, remind folks if there's anyone else who wanted to testify, um, you need to fill out one of these uh, appearance card slips. Okay. Um, Mr. Goldstein, you want to kick us off? By all means, that would be Jackie. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Good morning, my name is Jackie Gallant and I'm here on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council. As you probably already know, the NRDC is a national nonprofit legal and scientific organization that has been active on a wide range of environmental health, natural resource protection and quality of life issues around the world and right here in New York City since the organization was founded almost five decades ago. Over the years, one of our top priorities has been to safeguard drinking water quality both nationally and in New York City. New York City has more than 10,000 rooftop drinking water tanks. For millions of New Yorkers who reside or work in multi-story buildings, rooftop water tanks are the final stop on the journey of water from distant reservoirs to kitchen and bathroom taps. Thus, the city's substantial effort to safeguard water quality in our upstate reservoirs is jeopardized if we fail to include rooftop water tanks under the city's protective statutory umbrella. Unfortunately, investigations conducted in recent years have raised serious questions regarding the physical condition of some rooftop tanks and the quality of water within them. According to a 2015 New York Times article, many water tanks have thick layers of muddy sediment and conditions that are ripe for the growth of potentially dangerous microorganisms. In a May 2018 follow-up story in City and State New York, the author interviewed tank repair workers who described finding water tanks with drowned squirrels and pigeons, as well as tanks dirtied from dissolved um, sediment and sludge. One federal drinking water official quoted in the city and state article concluded that where such conditions are present, they create real potential for an increase in endemic disease. To be sure, we believe that overall, New York City's tap water is safe cons for consumers, but continued reports on water tank disrepair and poor maintenance are most definitely cause for concern. Evidence suggests that many landlords have not been complying with the water tank laws currently in place. Field investigations conducted by the Department of Health in 2010, 2011, and 2012 found that 59%, 42%, and 58% of buildings visited had no proof that their water tanks had been inspected in the previous year. A 2014 report from public advocate James reported that a survey conducted by the city found that 60% of landlords acknowledged that they did not comply with water tank laws. And the recent city and state New York investigative analysis found that managers of just 3,527 buildings with water tanks, an estimated 34% of the total, provided proof that their buildings had completed a tank inspection in 2017. Moreover, the city's statutory and regulatory program that governs these rooftop water tanks has critical gaps. Although there, there is no requirement to inspect water tanks annually, there's, or sorry, while there is a requirement to inspect water tanks annually, there is no across the board requirement to clean water tanks. Available reports re referenced before underscore the urgency of the problem. Making matters worse, the city still lacks essential information about the condition of water tanks. Many landlords have not complied with disclosure requirements. E even a, an exact figure on the number of citywide water tanks is apparently not available. Tellingly, the mayor's management report fails to provide any data on violations, enforcement, or compliance with the city's water tank laws. The bills that are the subject of today's hearing are all well intended, in particular, we support intro 1053, which would require water tank inspection companies to submit annual inspection reports directly to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. 
intro 1056, which would require the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct periodic unannounced inspections of water tanks and to post the results of the inspections online, and intro 1169, which would require the vi visual documentation of water tanks during inspections to be submitted to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene as a regular part of the reporting process. However, perhaps the most important part of our bill that the council could advance is one that would specifically mandate the annual cleaning of all New York City water tanks. As noted above, current law leaves too much discretion to building owners regarding whether or not to periodically clean their water tanks. While the current mandate states that building owners should rectify un unsanitary conditions, it does not directly require annual cleaning for all tanks, even though annual tank cleaning is a well-recognized best practice for water tank safety. Accordingly, we recommend that section 104.7 of the New York City Health Code be amended to include a provision that states that the owner, agent, or other person in control of a building shall have the water tank cleaned at least once annually. The cleaning shall comply with requirements provided in section 141.09 of this code. Buildings that fail to comply um, with this shall be subject to civil penalties no less than $1,000 and no greater than $5,000. The owner, agent, or other person in control of a building should also be required to submit proof of annual cleanings to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and retain documentation for at least five years from the day of the cleaning. In addition, we urge the council to take action so as to ensure that the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene steps up enforcement on building owners who fail to comply with their statutory obligations regarding water tank cleaning and maintenance. Thank you for holding this hearing. We hope that it will lead to legislative action by the council to ensure that all New Yorkers are protected from, the an uh, from unsanitary conditions in building water tanks. At the Natural Resources Defense Council, we stand ready to work with you to advance this important public health goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, um, for very well thought out testimony and for your support of, of these bills. Uh, Eric, did you have additional comments? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Eric Goldstein, New York City Environment Director at the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'd just like to briefly supplement the statement of my colleague, Jackie Gallant. I must say we're surprised by the tone of these hearings and the testimony of the Department of Health and the Department of Buildings, especially considering that these problems have been well known for at least four years since the New York Times original 2014 expose. We may not have evidence of a public health link between water tank maintenance and illness or disease, but that isn't the same thing as saying there is no such link or there is no such risk. Current systems of pharmaceutical reporting uh, which the city has employed is helpful in identifying widespread outbreaks of waterborne disease, but it is hardly a precise indicator of smaller scale problems or illnesses experienced by the most vulnerable people. And even if there is no or little actual threat, the failure of the council to act to address this problem can serve to undermine public confidence in the entire water supply system that the city is working with exceptional diligence to advance over many years and with expenditures of billions of dollars. Let's not pretend that we, when we have water tanks with holes in them, when we find dead rodents or feces floating in the tanks, that such conditions don't present at least some risk to health. There are two major weaknesses here that simply need to be addressed and resolved by council action. The first is the failure of all building owners to regularly clean tanks. Annual cleaning is simply a basic maintenance good practice and should be required by council legislation. The second major weakness is the failure to enforce. And here it simply is very revealing to hear the lack of activity by the buildings department in particular on this front. The council needs to use its various powers, both budgetary and legislative, to ensure that both the buildings department and the health department aggressively enforce these provisions. And several of the bills mentioned by uh, Ms. Gallant in our testimony uh, would make um, advances in that direction. It would indeed be unfortunate if this opportunity to safeguard the quality and reputation of our public water supply, which is presented by the hearings that you are calling, is not taken advantage of. And so we strongly urge you to 
have this hearing as a springboard for legislative action. Th thank you so much. And, and to e a question to either uh, you or, or Jackie as environmental advocates. What would be the environmental impact if New Yorkers switched from drinking tap water to bottled water? Well, it, it would be enormous and widespread. Uh, number one, uh, studies have demonstrated that bottled water is no safer nor better regulated than tap water. Second, bottled water is thousands of times more expensive than tap water. And so that for New Yorkers uh, who would be having to spend uh, hundreds of dollars a year on uh, bottled water, uh, particularly New Yorkers at the lower end of the income scale, this would be an enormous uh, fiscal burden on them. But most importantly, New York City has one of the most remarkable water supplies in the world. People come from all over the planet to visit the 19 upstate reservoirs and the water supply system that uh, the city has now spent several billion dollars protecting since the mid-1990s through cost-effective pollution prevention and watershed protection. And so from reservoirs that are 125 miles away uh, in watersheds west of the Hudson River, the city is taking uh, comprehensive steps to protect and uh, prevent pollution from entering that water. To have that come all the way down through our aqueducts, through the city's water mains, enter buildings, and then at the very final stop in the distribution system, the water tanks on top of buildings, not to have those facilities secured and protected and well-maintained would, would be folly on just so many levels. Uh, agreed, and, and of course, there's even a greenhouse gas impact uh, in this uh, debate because bottled water transported by diesel truck is going to uh, impact climate change in a way that water transported through Absolutely, water and just not, to, so. to uh, put an emphasis on that point, as you know, bottled water, nearby bottled water comes from states as, uh, from Maine and the West Coast and all. Some people, folks, are getting bottled water from Europe or uh, Fiji uh, or all around the, the planet that consumes an enormous amount of energy to get here, plus you've got the issue of uh, how you deal with those thousands, millions of plastic bottles every year. Right. So the environmental impacts of bottled water use are enormous, and uh, our New York tap water comes 95% by gravity. It's gravity-fed all the way uh, to our taps, uh, except pumped up to A miracle levels. of modern engineering, for sure. Um, thank you to NRDC, to both of you. Uh, Terry? Good morning, Councilman Levine. I feel like my thunder is taken out underneath me by the comments by the uh, DOH and by Mr. Goldstein, because I can reiterate a lot of those things in my testimony, and I think I shall, because I put the time and effort in to write it, so I think I'm obligated to say it. So once again, I am Terry O'Brien. I'm the Senior Director of the Plumbing Foundation. The Plumbing Foundation is a, uh, was founded in 86. It's a uh, nonprofit organization composed of large and uh, small plumbing companies, both union and non-union plumbers, engineering associations, supply houses, manufacturers, whose primary goal is uh, to protect the public and safety of New York City through enactment and enforcement of safe plumbing uh, and related codes. Broadly, I'd like to mention that the foundation strongly supports the, entire, uh, the entirety of today's agenda, which consists of several, seven pieces of legislation related to water tanks. In particular, however, we must single out our support to Councilman Levine's uh, bill intro 1157, which establishes qualifications criteria for inspecting, cleaning, coating, and painting of water tanks. I must note that this issue has been surrounding water tanks and inspection topics uh, at the foundation for decades. This is not a new idea. This is this predated uh, Legionella outbreaks. This is something we've tested by on, I would think, in my 12 years at least twice. But this goes back, like I said, decades. Uh, point of information. Uh, under the current administrative code, owners of buildings with water tanks as part of the drinking water supply tank must have these actual inspections uh, at least done annually, a little different than the health code. Uh, but in, that, in 2017, as mentioned by DOH, the council passed lo about local law 239, sponsored by then uh, council member, now speaker, Corey Johnson and former council member, Dan Gorodnik, which codified a DOH law that required landlords to file uh, to file building water tank inspections with the uh, DOH. 
These inspection reports are now required to be publicly available, which is commendable. The law also required DOH to report to the City Council the estimated number of water tanks in the city, the number of tanks inspected received by DOH, the number of violations issued for noncompliance, and we said, we heard that DOH says that will be probably available sometime beginning of next year, which is uh, very commendable. Uh, while the, we commend, like I said, the efforts of uh, the City Council and DOH regarding transparency of water tank inspection, the Administrative Code does not solicit criteria for when for who qualifies to conduct the inspection of water tanks. The code merely requires the inspection must comply with the applicable provisions of New York City Health Code. The Health Code, however, is silent about qualified people, persons. Uh, I'm gonna skip around a little bit, the, the testimony speak for itself, but regarding before about the uh, cleaning and inspections of coatings, because water tanks must be inspected annually in some circumstances that requires emptying and cleaning water tanks, the Health Code specifically section 14109, subsection B, requires cleaning to be coated uh, by a person who must be either a permit holder or a licensed master plumber. Uh, while there are vigorous uh, qualifications to be a licensed master plumber in New York City, they are clearly spelled out in the uh, New York City Building Code. It is not clearly, cl clear, it is, excuse me, it is unclear under the health code what the qualifications are for holding a permit. According to the uh, New York City business website, the applicable requirements are vague as a requirement to hold a permit for cleaning, painting, inspections, and coating of water tanks. I'm not going to read the, par the actual phrasing, but it sounds like DOH said there is room to uh, tighten that up for the sake of public good, which we have to actually agree on. Uh, furthermore, intro 1157 requires such persons to have additional fall protection under OSHA regulations, which I think everyone agrees safety is paramount to anyone doing construction in New York City. This requirement is important to ensure that these people climbing tanks for inspections uh, are appropriately trained in harness anchoring and other relevant safety protocols to protect themselves from dangerous falls. Uh, we must commend the council for intro 1157 because it mandates the water tanks are cleaned, inspected by properly trained persons, which will in turn ensure highest level of safety to both consumers and those technicians who work on water tanks. Uh, one last note is, uh, we had a further discussion, which we'd like to bring up to the council regarding testing of water. There's a lot of things regarding, uh, uh, we talk about cooling towers, but the vigorous testing of the whole water system, maybe for E. coli, lead, is something we would like to uh, go down in this discussion at a later date and time. So thank you, Councilman. Yes, the, the, the whole category of contaminants uh, is something that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, and we appreciate you raising that. And in fact, this did come up to some extent in our hearing last week on Legionnaires, um, which doesn't, li Legionella doesn't live in, in the water tanks on roofs because that's generally colder water. Uh, Legionnaire, Legionella, Legionella, as you well know, likes warm environments, but there is uh, a problem of, of Legionella living in the hot water systems and uh, I know that your, your members are on the front lines and attacking that issue and, and one that we care a lot about as well. If I can, I yes, please. I'd like to reiterate Mr. Goldstein's comments. Known cases, but DOH says, a lot different than unknown cases. You know, if you're in a cooling tower system, it's, it's readily, it's easy, to, it's high profile recently, but people get sick all the time. If it's any contamination, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but I'm not a, tech, uh, a trained professional, but logically speaking, you have a contamination in anything that gets to conduct uh, with water in any building source, it's in the whole building. So if it's in the, the cooling tower, or a contamination in the faucet, it's not relegated to just that one aspect. It's in the entirety of a building. So people have to think about it. It doesn't happen that often, but much the same case five years ago, there wasn't much talk about Legionella in New York City. Lo and behold, that's become a common issue. If we don't address these things before it happens, we're going to be having a, a, an epidemic uh, of some outbreak regarding water, maybe water tanks, if we don't get this properly addressed now. Yes, indeed. Thank you again, Terry, for being here and for your remarks. Um, Madam Deputy Borough President, Scott McFadden, thank you for coming to visit us. Bronx Deputy Borough President, please. Thank you, um, Chairman Levine. Good morning. Um, I am Deputy Bronx Borough President, Marika Scott McFadden. And I'm here today to testify in support of legislation introduced at Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr.'s behest, Intro 1056, 
by Council Members Constantinis, Levine, Torres, Diaz, and Persanios, and Ayala. This important le legislation will require the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to conduct periodic surprise inspections of water tanks, publicly post the results of these inspections, and conduct audits of annual inspection reports. The goal of this legislation is to prevent against any contaminants that can make New, York, New Yorkers ill, including but not limited to the Legionella, Legionella bacteria. Clean water is critical to good health, and it is not something that we can take for granted in the developed world, even in New York City, without adequate regulation. We have seen time and time again the health crises in this country where unsafe drinking water that has, that has ensued from unsafe drinking water. The most notable example being, of course, the ongoing crisis in Flint, Michigan. I recognize how important it is that New Yorkers have clean, safe water, and this legislation helps ensure that. Borough President Diaz has been a champion of safe water and safe water-based systems dating back to the Legionella crisis in the summer of 2015 when it became all too apparent that the system was not working and needed to be changed. Today, we are proud to continue to deliver for the city on this important issue through partnerships with our colleagues here in the New York City Council. Water tanks are used in more than 10,000 New York City buildings that are typically taller than six stories, according to official estimates. In recent years, landlords have been required to submit annual inspections to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene that the structures are free of sediment, bacteria, and other harmful substances. However, fewer than half did so between 2015 and 2017 the year the requirement became an official law, according to a May expose in City and State magazine. The existing law also allows the inspections to be done immediately after the tank is cleaned, meaning the city does not have a clear picture of how many dead pigeons, rats, cockroaches are floating in the water on any given day. There is a clear need for further smart regulation, and this bill is just that. I urge the City Council to pass this legislation into law. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Pearl President. We're happy that you're here and appreciate your comments, and um, certainly we support the bill that, that uh, you have introduced with, uh, with our colleagues in the Council. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, this concludes this panel. Thank you all very much. And, and this concludes our hearing.